Hey guys, it's Pastor Courtney here. Hope you guys are having a great day. Wanted to share a little story with you this morning that you might find relatable, maybe a little funny. I know I did after the fact. Um, I made an appointment <laughs> this week for a water filter to be changed in our house. And then after that, I immediately forgot all about it. So Wednesday morning rolls around, the doorbell rings, and I feel a moment of panic, like, oh no. Because we're all still in our jammies. <laughs> and I open up the door and there's the water guy. And I'm thinking, oh no, we've got dishes in the sink. The basement has a giant fort built in it. And both of those places he needs to go. So I know he's on a time crunch, so I welcome him in and I start apologizing about our mess. Um, and he kind of laughs it off and explains how he has three kids that are now grown up and he knows, you know, life can be messy. And then he said something that I thought about a lot over the next few days. He said, those were the days. Those were the days looking back on when he had his little kids at home. And that's not something new or particularly like earth shattering. I had heard it before from a lot of people when they learn that my kids are three and five years old and our life is really messy and kind of crazy. I've heard a lot of people say, those were the days, mm. or it goes by so fast. Mm. And over the next few days after he left, he was only at our house a short time, thankfully. <laughs> but I thought a lot, like, how often when we're in the midst of our day-to-day -day life do we think, man, these are the days. These are the days. Mm. I know that I try to be really intentional um, with my kids, helping them build memories and playing with them and trying to fuel their imagination. And I'm trying to make them responsible citizens by helping around the house and doing chores and doing their part. But reality is that after they are tucked into bed at night and I come downstairs and look around, I sometimes feel a little bit overwhelmed at the mess that awaits me. <laughs> There's dishes, laundry, crumbs, endless crumbs. Uh, bills, schedule, meal planning, because I know they'll have to eat the next day. I have to keep them alive. Schooling, work, all that jazz. And maybe some of you guys can relate to that. Or maybe your mess is more along the lines of financial, emotional, maybe health. And that list goes on. And I don't know about you, but I can let myself be really easily overwhelmed and maybe a little depressed and even feel exhausted. But most of all, I can let myself become distracted. And I know that Satan wants to use my mess to distract me from the miracles that God wants to do in the midst of it. Notice I didn't say in spite of it or when it's under control or when it's all cleaned up and pristine. God wants to do miracles in the midst of our mess because the truth is life is messy and God works best in the midst of the mess. I want you to think about that. If everything were perfect in your life, would you need God? Would you pray and connect with him? Would you rely on him? If everything were perfect, I think we would miss out on the reason why we were created, to be in a relationship with our creator. It's our mess that leads us to God and causes us to lean on him. And you know what? Life is a beautiful mess most of the time. <laughs> It's beautiful because God gets into the mess with us and turns it into a miracle. You know, we might get caught up in thinking that our mess is too much for God to work with or that we need to clean it up, make it nice and shiny before God can work a miracle. We might even think that things are too far gone for God to do anything at all. But the opposite is true. And I want to show you a story from Luke chapter 8 that backs this up. Now, Little side note, um, as a pastor, I read the Bible a lot. It's my job, but it's also my passion. And sometimes reading the same verses over and over um, can kind of just make them become noise to us. And they don't come to life the way they did maybe the first time you read them or when we were first saved. And so I have found that reading different versions of the Bible, just mixing it up a little bit, or reading from a children's Bible, um, like I do with my kids, really helps me see a different perspective of what God's trying to say to me through that passage. So this is from the Jesus Storybook Bible, which I highly recommend. It's a good one. My kids love it, and it, most of the time it wrecks me too, because <laughs> I'm like, Lord, I hear you speaking. And uh, this story is called A Little Girl and a Poor Frail Lady. 
There was once a little girl who didn't get out of bed one morning or the next or the next. In fact, she didn't get out of bed for a whole month. She was very sick and no one knew how to make her better. Jarius was her daddy and he loved her. One day he was sitting by her bed, holding her hand, wishing there was something he could do. Sounds messy. I know, he said. He jumped to his feet, put on his coat, kissed his daughter, ran down the steps, 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 past the servants, out of the house, through the gates, along the road, into the town, up the steps, 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 and into the temple. He fought his way through all the people until at last he found who he was looking for. Jesus, he said, falling at Jesus' feet. My daughter, he pleaded, please. But he didn't need to beg, because before he'd even finished speaking, Jesus reached out his hand and helped him up. I'll come at once, Jesus said. Jairus' eyes filled with tears. Jesus was coming. It would be all right. In those days, of course, they didn't have ambulances, so they had to go by foot. Jesus' helpers knew that he would heal the sick girl, but they must hurry. If Jesus didn't get there soon, it would be too late. But everyone was in the way, hustling and bustling, jostling and pressing, pushing and shoving, squishing and squashing. The disciples ran ahead, forcing back the crowd. Suddenly, Jesus stopped. His friends looked back. What was he doing? Who touched me, Jesus asked, because he felt power go out of him. Me, said a frail lady looking down at the ground because she was ashamed. The poor lady had been sick for 12 years and she had to get well. She knew if she only touched Jesus' coat, she would be healed. So she touched his coat and instantly she was well. A miracle in the midst of a mess. We don't have time, Jesus' friend said. But Jesus always had time. He reached out his hands and gently lifted her head. He looked into her eyes and smiled. You believed, he said, wiping away a tear from her eye, and now you are well. Just then, Jairus' servant rushed up to Jairus. It's too late, he said breathlessly. Your daughter is dead. Jairus turned, or Jesus turned to Jairus. It's not too late, Jesus said. Trust me. At Jairus' house, everyone was crying, but Jesus said, I'm going to wake her Everyone laughed at him because they knew she was dead. Sounds about as messy as it can get. Jesus walked into the little girl's room. Now listen. And there lying in the corner in the shadows was the still little figure. Jesus sat in the bed and he took her pale hand. Honey, he said, it's time to get up. And he reached down into death and gently brought that little girl back to life. And the little girl woke up and she rubbed her eyes as if she had just had a good night's sleep and she leapt out of bed. Jesus threw open the shutters and sunlight flooded the dark room. Hungry, Jesus asked. She nodded. Jesus called to her family, bring the little girl some breakfast. Jesus helped and healed many people like this. He made blind people see. He made deaf people hear. He made lame people walk. Jesus was making the sad things come untrue. You know, God is waiting for us to invite him into our mess because he's the only one who can clean it up. I love how it says he reached down into death. He wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. He takes our messes and he turns them into miracles. The mess is a vehicle that drives us to the miraculous. The Bible says that the very problems and trials we face daily are good for us. Because God can use them to develop our character so that others may see the reflection of his beauty in us. So don't hide your mess. Admit it to God. Invite him to start working a miracle in your life. Then be transparent with others so they can see the beauty of Christ reflected through your mess and your brokenness. One of my favorite scriptures is 2 Corinthians 4, 7. It says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We're jars of clay on the outside, but on the inside we carry the beauty and the brilliance of Christ. And the more cracked and broken, broken the jar of clay is, the more Christ's power and his beauty shine through. So don't try to hide your mess. Bring the broken, messy pieces of your life to God and let him make something beautiful out of them, guys. As you look at the many problems surrounding you, don't be overwhelmed. Sift through the piles and the rubble and spot it. Spot the miracle in the midst of that mess because that's what God has in store for us. Love you so much. And remember, these are the days. Bye.